Welcome to Primity, where we find simple techniques to help address modern problems for our primitive bodies. My name is Andrew Pafford, and I'm a health and wellness professional with over a decade of experience helping Olympic athletes, desk jockeys, and seniors achieving their goals and improving their quality of life. Our purpose with Primity is to distill results of scientific findings into easily approachable strategies and techniques to improve health and wellness for everyday life. So today, we are talking about hypertension and how salt may not be the culprit it's been painted out to be. So first and foremost, let's start with just saying that it absolutely has a role. There's plenty of studies that show that yes, salt does play a huge, huge role. There's plenty of studies that have shown that there is efficacy and strong correlation that by decreasing salt intake, you can lower hypertension. However, some of those studies address the fact that only 50 to 60% of the population is affected by this. That is not a small number. That's a lot of people. That's half your population. But that also leaves a whole other half of your population that is not affected by salt and could still very well have hypertension. So there's still a very large portion of the population that's kind of being left in the dark without any viable answers. So let's do a little bit more of a deep dive today about what actually is going on, how does this work, why is it not just the end-all be-all, and what other factors can come into play, and most importantly, what can we do about it? So on a very basic chemistry level, salt is a electrolyte. Water is drawn towards electrolytes. You can do a very simple experiment with this. It involves a very, I mean, we did this in grade school. It was a semi-permeable membrane. Basically, only water can go through this thing. And you imagine taking like a glass of water and putting a membrane right down the middle. So the water is effectively divided in half. If you sprinkle salt on one side of that membrane, the salt cannot cross through. So one half has water, one half has salt water, and the salt cannot mix evenly between the two sides. It stays on the one side. Because that salt exists on one side of the membrane, it is effectively lowering the concentration of water. There's 100% water on one side and 50% water and 50% salt on the other side. Through basic chemistry, it wants to try to balance out those concentrations. So water will actually pass through the membrane towards the salt. So as you look at the glass, the side that has the salt water is actually now contains more fluid than the side that is just pure water. This is how our bodies retain fluid. So if we were to not have electrolytes, and I'm sure you've probably heard about this with, you know, dehydration and whatnot, if you don't have electrolytes, it is hard and almost impossible for our bodies to keep the water inside because it would want to escape. So that's the job of the electrolytes. The unique thing about salt is that it likes to exist predominantly in our bloodstream. So we have sodium, calcium, potassium, and magnesium are your four main electrolytes. Salt is an electrolyte. It is necessary for our survival. If you don't have enough salt, you could very well keel over. That's actually... A medical condition called hyponutremia. It literally means too little salt in the blood. Without that, the water escapes. There's not enough blood in your pipes. So now you have too low blood pressure and you stroke out because blood's not getting everywhere it needs to go. So salt is absolutely vital to our survival. That being said, in the example of that semi-permeable membrane in that glass, what happened was when there was too much salt on one side, it pulled all of the water over to the one side. Now imagine that that water with the salt is your blood. So the more salt you have in your blood, the more fluid is going to want to stay within your blood vessels to the point where imagine um, pipes for like a metaphor for your blood vessels. If there's too much water in your pipes, you have too much pressure, and now you're at risk for rupturing a pipe. Same for your blood vessels. If there's too much pressure, that can cause damage over time and potentially a uh, aneurysm. 
not great, right? So blood pressure, super important. That's why we are concerned about it. It's a very easy thing to screen for for doctors, and it can be an indicator for all different types of mortalities or metabolic issues. So on a very basic chemistry level, yeah, having too much salt can lead to those problems. However, we are not basic chemistry. While it can play a huge role, our body is a little bit more complicated than that. We are evolved for survival. So we have other fun things that can help regulate salt in our bodies, like hormones and our kidneys and our liver, things that were not there in that simple glass semipermeable membrane example. So if we have too much salt, our bodies have ways of processing that and eliminating that and controlling our blood pressure through other various levers and switches, if you will. So it's not just a straightforward, too much salt equals high blood pressure. It's not that simple. For some people, that can be a viable explanation, but for others, not so much. So to start with our first example about that, we're going to go into a study that I found called Stress, Salt, and Hypertension by James Henry. And ultimately what they did was they not only studied rats, but they also had a human model as well to kind of prove this example. And so what they did was they started with rats in a, basically a laboratory that were um, socially trained. So it's rats used to being around other rats. They were not born in isolation and kept in isolation. So it wasn't like they had never seen another rat before. But a rat that was socially trained and then isolated. So it was taken away from other rats. And then it was given a high salt diet. In that isolation with the high salt diet, the rat did not develop high blood pressure. However, after being on that high salt diet, when the rat was then, as they say um, in the study, psychosocially stimulated, so put back in with other rats, whether it was having confrontations, whatever, it was mentally stimulated by being around other rats, so being social, it then began to develop high blood pressure. So it was a combination of the salt and potentially the stress from being around other rats. Uniquely, after the blood pressure began to rise, they took the rat off high salt. So they reduced its salt intake back to nominal or even decreased levels. And in spite of this, the blood pressure remained high. So that right there is a big, big flag of how salt is not the only factor involved in hypertension. And to further this, they even found in Italy a sect of nuns who had high salt intake for over 20 years just based on local diet, foods that were available, what have you. And in spite of having high salt diet for 20 years, they had normal blood pressure. Totally fine. However, literally in the village, just adjacent, so same, able to also um, <clears throat> study group of uh, study the women in the local village, almost identical diets because it was very local, same regions. They're not like getting fast food and stuff all over the place or traveling abroad. So at the nearby village, same diet for these women. On average, the blood pressure for the women in that village would rise by two millimeters of mercury every year. So that's pressure, how they would manage their blood, how they would measure their blood pressures in millimeters of mercury. So literally, on average, the women in that nearby village, every year, their average blood pressure would go up by two points. Every year. So within 10 years, their blood pressure would have gone up 20 points, which is huge. Considering if 120 over 80 is normal, 130 is a little sketchy, and 140 is hypertension, you're talking, you're going from normal to hypertension in 10 years. That's very quick onset, on average. So you have... Same genders, same diet consumptions, same age groups approximately, and yet one group is totally fine while the other group is developing hypertension. And the only difference is one is kept in effectively seclusion. They're not having all of these social stresses placed upon them while the others are. So that's the other example, this time now in humans, of the exact same thing that was demonstrated in those rat models of 
It's not just salt causing hypertension. So doing a little bit more deep dive of what is going on, what is this other factor that's potentially working in conjunction with the salt or even hijacking what the salt might be igniting, if you will. So because of these psychosocial stimulations, aka you're talking to other people, you're going through normal stresses of having to deal with other people, with their crap, with their interactions, their intricacies, you know, what have you, their oddities, it inevitably can be stressful. And so what they found or what we've been finding is that your stress, as most of us are aware, when you get stressed, you develop, you secrete a hormone called cortisol. Cortisol is part of our um, sympathetic nervous system, essentially. It's the sympathetic nervous system engages. It tells the adrenal glands above the kidneys to release cortisol, which then has effects on the body. Cortisol is in charge of increased breathing, blood pressure, heart rate, etc. So this is the old metaphor of if a tiger jumps out of the bushes, this is the thing that helps you run for your life. Because when you need to perform, Having higher blood pressure means you're more likely to get blood delivered to places where it's needed. We're talking, if we're, again, using the pipe metaphor for our blood pressure, when you open your spigot and a little bit of water comes out, the, hard, the higher your water pressure, the faster the water is going to be coming out. So in this instance, the faster that blood is going to flow through your veins. That coupled with your increased heart rate. And of course, with the increased breathing, all of that blood that's flowing is also now more oxygenated. So you're delivering more oxygen to those muscles that need it to help develop energy to make you run so that you don't get eaten by a tiger. Done and done. So cortisol is a necessary component for our survival. However, almost all of the systems in our body have a counterbalance. Everything exists in our body in balance. For every push, there is a pull. So if cortisol is your on switch, we need to have an off switch. Otherwise, we'll burn out, right? So if you can't, you can't run your car in the red zone all the time or your engine's going to blow up. You got to shut your car off to be able to do maintenance periodically and on the regular. So the off switch is another, another compound released by the adrenal glands. We'll give you the long name and then we're going to abbreviate it. But it's dehydroepi androsterone and it's I, almost identical um, form is dehydroepi androsterone sulfate. So we have DHEA and DHEAS. The difference is, is that even though DHEA is the active form, it actually breaks down very quickly. So the body likes to store it as DHEAS. So you can think of DHEAS as S for storage, if you will, even though it stands for sulfate. So the DHEAS and then the active form of DHEA. Now this is important because not only is DHEA effectively the off switch or the antithesis to cortisol, but DHEA is also a precursor for many of our sex hormones, so testosterone and types of estrogen like estradiol. So this is very important for development and maintenance. So I know a big thing for like guys, when you're trying to build muscle, you want testosterone. It plays a huge, huge role. Well, if you are not able to produce enough of DHEA, that can directly correlate to low T, low testosterone, which you've probably seen bouncing around in the media a whole bunch. Now, think of it this way. If you are constantly under stress, if you're constantly releasing cortisol, when does your body get a chance to switch gears for your adrenal glands to release DHEA. One is the on switch, one is the off switch. If you're always telling your body on, 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 you're being stressed constantly, when do you ever get to enjoy the off switch? When do you ever get to release that precursor to not only bring down your blood pressure, but to also help form that precursor, to also help form your other hormones that you need for building muscle and what have you. So. To reiterate, cortisol is for stress, DHEA is the opposite. Now, these exist in the balance. You're never going to have only one or the other at any given time. Your body can do both. The caveat is you kind of ebb and flow. So there are times when you need to have that increased breathing and whatnot. So like when you are exercising, that is effectively emulating that form of physical stress of you know running from the tiger. 
So you need the increase in blood pressure and heart rate and breathing. So exercise can technically activate cortisol. However, you need to be able to come off of that, which is where the DHEA comes in. So if you are never giving yourself enough time to effectively de-stress or to wind down or to put it in neutral, whatever metaphor you want to go for, then you're never able to really recover from your workouts or lower your blood pressure from these stressful events. So to further the importance of DHEA, we have another study. This is cortisol DHEA sulfate, so DHEAS, their ratio and all-cause and cause-specific mortality in the Vietnam Experience study. So this study was done by Annecy Phillips and others. And ultimately what they found was that there exists in the body a ratio of cortisol and DHEA. So as we just established earlier, it's not one or the other. They both exist simultaneously, but depending on what gear you're in is going to determine what ratio you have at any given time. So if I'm feeling stressed, my cortisol is going to be higher and my DHEA is going to be lower. If I'm feeling calm and zen and wu-sa, my cortisol is going to be lower and my DHA is going to be higher. These levels vary wildly between person to person and even within that person, depending on the time of day and the activity that they're involved in. Caveat is what is the average of that ratio? Are you always more cortisol than DHA? Or are you about even even? Do you have days where your DHA is much higher? In your cortisol, it depends, right? But what they found is that the concentration of cortisol alone does not show a direct association with all cause mortality. So just because you have high cortisol doesn't mean you're going to die from any other thing at a higher degree of um, possibility. However, the concentration of DHEAS is negatively associated which is a good thing. Negatively just means it's inverse. So the higher the DHEAS you have, the less likely you're going to have of all-cause mortality or all-cause of cancer. So that's the negative association. So if one goes up, the other goes down. That's what that means. So that's a good thing. That means the more DHA you have, the less likely you are to succumb to any other, re- any other causes of mortality. The higher the ratio of cortisol to DHEAS is positively associated with all cause mortality, cancer, and other medical cause mortality. So that means in that ratio, your cortisol could be high, but if your DHEAS is also high as well, let's say you've got a one-to-one ratio, then that means you're fine. But once cortisol starts to skew higher than DHEA, that's when it is positively associated with all of the bad stuff. So the more you have cortisol higher than your DHEA and at larger amounts or larger ratio, that's when all those other factors start to come into play. So all-cause mortality. So we're talking hypertension because that can be a problem. So that kind of leads to the next obvious solution. Okay, so obviously high cortisol all the time, bad. Low DHA in conjunction with that is bad. How do we lower cortisol and increase DHEA? Now, obviously the people are going to be saying, all right, well, I just need to get my blood work done, which is a good thing to know where you are. And remember, time of day matters too. So even if you are totally healthy, when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be spiked with cortisol because that's how your body wakes you up and gets you going. As you start to wind down in the evening, your cortisol is going to drop and it should actually even bottom out while you're asleep. You should have almost no cortisol like at it within the first like stage or two of your of sleep cycles. So even within the person, that's going to vary wildly depending on when your blood sample is taken. So just keep that into consideration. But uh, let's see here. So if you do get your blood work done and it does show that your cortisol is rampantly higher than your DHEA, do not immediately jump to taking supplements. Remember, there is a risk involved with supplementation. There's always just out of the gate, you don't know if what you're getting is actually good. 
supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So just because something says on the label that it has this stuff doesn't mean it's there or in the quantity that it's measured. There's always that error of margin that people can operate within. And if you're talking like milligrams and you have like, um, I don't know, like a 10 to 15% margin of error, what little there should be could be even less or worse. There could be way more than advertised and you could have some negative side effects depending on the compound you're taking. So supplements, out of the gate, you're not even sure if what you're getting is real. Number two, there's not always a guarantee that the synthetic compounds that you're getting are even absorbed by the body. That's the other big risk with taking exogenous compounds, meaning things that were made outside of the body, is that they're typically not organic. They were not made by another human being, extracted, and then put into another human being. The only way we know that these compounds work is when we are using things that our bodies have made. So there is a very, very slim margin that they have done thorough, adequate testing of their compound to prove that their stuff is legit. Chances are they paid off the scientists to do the studies that said that it worked because if the scientists said it didn't work, they didn't get paid. So they have a vested interest. So of course, even the studies done by a lot of these pharmaceutical companies need to be taken with a grain of salt. So what are the all natural ways for us to regulate our cortisol and DHEA? So there's a couple things. Number one, a study done called uh, Impact of New Emotional Self-Management Program on Stress, Emotions, Heart Rate Variability, DHEA, and Cortisol long title, but this one was very, very intriguing. This study was done by Roland McCready and others, and there'll be links to the studies in the show notes, so you guys can uh, look at their um, methods and whatnot on your own. But ultimately, they had an experimental group against a control group, and in the experimental group, they measured cortisol and DHA levels as well as did a survey of their emotions. So they were then ranking their caring, happiness, guilt, anxiety, the good and the bad on sort of this subjective, so on a scale of their subjective emotions and ranking them on the scale. In the study, they did two different types of mindfulness techniques. One was called the heart lock-in technique and the other one was called the cut-through technique. Not going to go into the nitty gritty on the techniques. We'll just say that they were doing mindfulness approaches. And they did this, I believe, at least once a day over the course of four weeks. Now, here's the cool thing. After the four weeks had transpired, when they then remeasured their cortisol and DHEA levels, they found that the cortisol dropped by 23%. So that's pretty big. That's almost a quarter of what it was. So cortisol down, always a good thing. However, their DHEA levels increased by 100% on average. That is huge. That is huge. I believe they had 23 people in the experimental group. Could be wrong on that. But it was enough that that is a huge, huge finding. It was not a sample size of three. Let's put it that way. So that right there is a big promising factor. So... Long story short, they basically got these people to meditate for like 20 minutes a day for four weeks. So within a month's time, just from simple thinking happy thoughts techniques, to put it very simplistically and reductively, they were able to have drastic changes on their cortisone and DHEA levels. So that right there is a huge, hopeful, easy, low barrier to entry to anybody of if you can spend 10 to 20 minutes to execute basically now all these mindfulness tools that are wildly readily available via YouTube and other electronic platforms, you can totally turn around your cortisol stress and through the transitive property, your hypertension by lowering your stress levels and increasing your DHEA, which is that off switch that helps bring that high blood pressure and brings those other factors back into control. So now step number two is exercise. So in this study, it was DHEA, DHEA-S, and cortisol responses to acute exercise in older adults in relation to exercise training status and gender, or and sex, I should say. So in this study, they looked at 49 community-dwelling adults, so basically in nursing homes, 23 females and 26 males. So these are people in basically their golden years, 
where their levels are already coming down. Because as we age, our DHA levels tend to drop already. So we can imagine that a lot of the activities, in a sense, are arguably blunted because everything's starting to slow down at this age. So they had their 46, 49 participants perform an incremental submaximal treadmill test for 30 minutes. So in layman's terms, they put them on the treadmill, and they started them out slow, and they gradually began to ramp up the intensity until it's on average they reached about 76% of their predicted maximum heart rate. So there's sort of a not great accurate, but I guess it's a ballpark method of predicting your maximum heart rate based on your age. It's like 220 minus your age, which I've had people go over that, and that's like their jogging heart rate. Basically, they operate there and they have a good time. So it really depends on the, con- the conditioning of the person. However, in this case, they're, they're in their golden years. They're not trying to make someone stroke out because their heart gave out because they made him, made him do wind sprints on a treadmill. So they got him within 76%. So three quarters of their way to the arguably already low set maximum heart rate. So they, they weren't trying to you know kill these people over. They were trying to be smart about this. So with this submaximal treadmill test, so basically they're on the treadmill and they did a light moderate to honest moderate jog, if you will, or at least whatever speed needed to get their heart rate up to about three quarters of their operating percent. They had blood work taken prior to beginning the test, immediately after they hopped off the treadmill, and then a whole hour after the exercise had ended. And what they found was that their DHEA increased immediately post-exercise. So the active compound was already up. So the moment the exercise ended and that physical exertion was over, their body was already releasing the off switch to try to help the body calm down from that stressful event. However, DHEAS, so the storage form, storage form was only significantly increased in the women. So Both sexes were able to benefit from the active compound. However, the storage compound was more readily increased in women. So you can expect them to have longer lasting effects after the fact because it's easier for the body to pull that DHEA out of the storage form and into the active form once it's already out there. Cortisol, however, decreased immediately after and one hour after exercise. So you can imagine during the exercise that cortisol was slightly elevated just to help them execute their work to get that increase in blood pressure and heart rate and breathing. But then immediately after it ended and they were able to stop and rest, their body said, all right, the stressful event is over. Let's bring her back down. And so DHEA went into action. Cortisol got out of the way. So that push-pull system flipped. So this is now helping correct that ratio of cortisol to DHA. And not only did it happen right after the exercise ended, but an hour after it ended, that cortisol was still suppressed and that DHEA was still elevated. So imagine you have, let's say, a stressful day in the office. Even though you are not performing physical activity, your body responds to stress the same way. It releases cortisol. So that's been pumping through your system, whether your boss is yelling at you, whether you had bad customer, you have to deal with angry customers, maybe you were the angry customer, I don't know. But after that stressful event, because you weren't actually physically engaged in activity, you're not telling your body that the threat is over. We were kind of creating our own psychosocial threats And so that cortisol stays elevated in spite of the quote-unquote threat being over. There was no physical change, so the body doesn't get the memo to come out of threat mode. So by going into physical activity, you are now providing that physical stress. And once that's removed, the body is then able to say, okay, threat's over, cortisol down, DHEA up. So you can actually hack exercise as a way of getting stressed down. Even though the exercise in and of itself can be stressful, that at least gives the body a definitive, physical, tangible marker that threat done, go into recovery mode. So already you've got two 
very useful, simple, effective, easily accessible tools to be able to help manage stress. Depending on how you go about doing them, both of which can take little to no time whatsoever. So the takeaway from this is hypertension is not just a salt problem. It is very much also a stress problem. In isolation, salt might not even be the problem. And as we found, even once hypertension has been established, removing salt may not always be the determining factor as well. If you want to come up, or if you want to use a crude metaphor to think of it this way, think of salt as the gasoline and cortisol is the fire. If you just have gallons on gallons and gallons of gasoline, you're pumping salt all day without that match, without that psychosocial stress to ignite the gas, there is no fire. There is no problem. You just have lots of gas lying around. However, once lit, even without the gasoline, once it's been ignited, even if you stop throwing fuel on the fire, that fire is going to keep burning as long as there's that stress. There's still fire. There's still cortisol. So even with no more gasoline, once ignited, that puppy's going to burn for a while. So just removing salt, just removing the gas from the equation is not enough to put the fire out. So work these angles if you're having trouble controlling your blood pressure and you're not yet on meds. So if you're, even if you're young, middle-aged, old, if you're finding that your blood pressure is beginning to creep up, try and not, of course, removing salt is a viable option. But if you've already lowered your intake and you're not having success, and you feel like you're beating your head against a wall and you really don't want to go on medications, find a respectable meditation program, some sort of mindful practice. I personally am still exploring some options. I have one that I'm currently trying now. So I don't quite need any suggestions just yet, but not in a position to also advertise what it is because I can't attest to it. At the moment, it seems promising, so we'll pour back later. But find a mindfulness program that you can adhere to. The biggest thing is adherence. Something can, you know, people can tell you something works till they're blue in the face, but if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. So find something that you're going to adhere to, something that is going to be effective and you're going to keep doing. And same rule applies also for the other angle, which is exercise. Find something that you're going to keep doing. I don't care if it is the most effective functional exercise known to man. If you hate it with a passion that burns like the sun and you're never going to keep doing it, then you're not going to do it and it's not going to work. So find something that you know you can do that's going to get your blood pumping so that way your body has to go into recovery mode. If you just go for a 30-minute walk, it might be a peaceful walk, but if it's not challenging your body, if it's not eliciting that physical stress, that may not be enough to entice your body to go into recovery mode because it wasn't a stress at all. It was a nice peaceful walk. So you might need to do some honest to goodness, actual hot, sweaty, get down to business work. If you are on meds, these interventions are obviously clutch for you to try and monitor your blood pressure while doing so. If you haven't already, invest in a, they're called sphygmomanometers, but basically it's the blood pressure cuffs. You can get these at home for like 30 bucks, and I believe you can take it to a doctor's office and have them calibrated to make sure that they're accurate or reasonably accurate, and then track your blood pressure on your own. Take multiple readings in the morning when you wake up, middle of the day, and before you go to bed. Do these over the course like keep doing this to get a record and a trend because one day could be high, one day could be low, depending on factors in your life. But the trend is what's important. What is your average? Once you've got that trend, factoring in now your mindfulness practices and some exercise and see how it goes. If your blood pressure is starting to go down, talk to your doctor and say, hey, I'm trying these new lifestyle changes. They're seeming to be promising. Let's talk about my blood pressure medication now. For the love of goodness, do not modify your prescription without consulting your physician. 
especially if you are on multiple medications, they can be causing all kinds of different side effects and balancing each other out and whatever. If you're not the doctor, don't be changing your prescriptions. Doctors are more than happy to get you off meds if you're making smart lifestyle changes. And as like every single med commercial that I've ever seen on TV says, taken in conjunction with diet and exercise and lifestyle modification, like, yeah, of course that stuff's going to work because that's the whole point. <laughs> that's what you should have been doing in the first place. So talk to your doctor if these are starting to show promise. Let them know and have that talk. But do not, for the love of Pete, modify your meds without talking to your doctor. That's how you can get into some serious trouble. But that being said, hopefully we've shed a little bit more light on the mechanism of hypertension, how it's not just a salt problem, but also a stress problem as well, and two easily approachable, low barrier to entry methods for controlling that blood pressure. So that's it for today's episode, and we're looking forward to seeing you next time on Primity.